Hello and welcome to Masterclass number 11. This is the 11th Masterclass in a series that I put together for both the Permaculture Education Institute and also our Permaculture Life programs. Tonight's topic is all about designing for integrating chickens into your landscape to create an environment for happy chickens and really delicious and nutritious eggs. My name is Morag Gamble. And as I said, I'm from the Permaculture Education Institute. Now, if you're listening to this live, I really welcome you to go ahead and introduce yourself on the chat. You can find the section at the bottom to click on and open up the chat bar. And I'd love to hear where you're from and and um, what your name is. And, and that would be great to start. I'll start chatting with you in the side. Also, I really do encourage you to ask questions as we go along too. So welcome again. And I really do hope you enjoy this session. Uh, I absolutely love chickens. I've, ha I've had chickens in my life for as long as I can remember. And uh, integrating them into our, and our household and seeing how much our kids love having chickens in their life too is just a wonderful thing. So I'm really happy to be able to sponsor these masterclasses through the Permaculture Education Institute. I hope that they're really valuable and useful to you and I look forward to you sending in information too about what you'd like me to run future ones about. Uh, so let's get into happy chickens. So what I'm really wanting to focus on in this masterclass is particularly about what it is that chickens need to be happy and healthy. How can you create an environment for chickens that means that they are really well cared for, that they have uh, really no problems, that they, they get what they need and they're integrated into your permaculture garden system. It's not like a separate entity, that they're actually really a functional and useful species as well as being happy in and of themselves. So it's not just a functional relationship, although it is that too, it's also about um, caring for the chicken's well-being. And the other side of it too is that really the better that we look after our chickens and the more diversity and nutritious food that we feed them, and I think the happier they are, the better quality eggs that we we will be able to collect from those chickens so uh, in we get much better food quality out of that too i mean anyone who knows who has chickens who's harvested them and just cracks them open after they've been fed on you know wonderful greens how rich the color of the yolk is and there is research that shows that the quality of the eggs produced in an industrial system as opposed to the quality and nutritional value of the eggs that you receive from um, your homegrown, well-fed chickens. It's, it's worlds apart, really. I mean, you've got to just think about um, what goes in is going to come out. So you know what's actually going into your, into your healthy chickens in your own yard then you know that you're going to get high quality eggs, high quality nutritious food out of that um, system. And, you know, one of the things that I absolutely love about a permaculture garden is just being able to pop out into the garden, collect a few eggs, grab a range of different greens and herbs and salad veggies and put it all together, make an eggy bake or an omelette with a bit of a salad. And that's a really fabulous meal. And we, we use this a lot in our home um, you know I have a family here and much of what we eat is based around this simple food and it's and it's absolutely fantastic and so being able to be self-sufficient in terms of food um, doesn't require necessarily to have a massive great area you can live on a smaller amount of area if you eat simply and chickens are a really really important part uh, as I hope you'll appreciate through this um, session they're a really important part of helping to create that system but before we go on I just wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit about the history of chickens and it's important to think about this because if we understand where they're from and where they are uh, how they naturally lived 
we can uh, think about how they like to live now. So essentially they're domesticated from wild jungle fowl from Southeast Asia and they were first tamed around, I don't know, 7,000 BC was some of the information that I was able to find. It's a really long time ago. And this is sort of somewhere that there's discussion about whether that's China or India, but essentially around um, the Asian region. And what you find is that those original chickens were much leaner, really fast, lived in the forest, um, really like that protection and safety. And so actually integrating a chicken into a food forest, into a covered environment does mean that they are typically sort of a much happier and and healthier in that environment and I also wanted to mention too that um, just the difference this is this is the diagram that if you've ever picked up one of Bill Mollison's permaculture books the permaculture designers manual or the intro to permaculture you probably would have seen this diagram giving kind of an indication of the difference between an industrial egg and a permaculture egg so essentially A permaculture egg is one that is integrated into the system. It has some inputs, of course, um, but mostly what you're trying to create is a a flock of chickens that are fed from within the system, that the the manures that they create um, go back into the system, their behaviours of wanting to sort of pick up insects and pests help you in that system too, and... As a, as a byproduct of that other those other behaviors, you also get eggs. Now, it's really kind of surprising too that uh, it's at least 180 liters per egg in an industrial system, and it's just an extraordinary amount of embodied energy and in embodied resources, embodied water that goes into that industrial system. And what we're getting at the end of that are lesser quality eggs, and also unhappy chickens, sick chickens that are really prone to disease and don't have a great life and and the quality um, you know uh, for me the choice is there's there is no choice I I I think about the life of the chickens and I think about the impact that that kind of system's having and I, and I really can't participate in that so if I am going to eat eggs I really believe that it's important to either support people who are growing the um the chickens and just um raising chickens and looking after chickens in a natural environment or having them myself and the other thing too is that quite often the chickens that you get and the eggs that you get from an industrial system are quite old they could be you know up to three months old so if you do have eggs um sorry my little eggs aren't quite eggy shaped but anyway never mind Um, how do you tell whether your eggs are fresh or not most of you probably know this little trick but I thought I'd include it anyway so if you want to check whether your eggs are fresh or not you can put them in a bowl of water the ones that lay down on the bottom of the bowl they're the fresh ones the ones that kind of stand up but still stay submerged they might be a bit old but they're still edible if they float however um, they're the ones you need to toss out into your compost so what do chickens need We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, water, food, shelter, their roosting needs, nesting, dust bathing, their love and companionship, um, and also how to connect them and their their need to be in proximity. And we'll talk a little bit about the breeds too. And I hope you like the little picture that my five-year-old has drawn of a chicken. He absolutely adores chickens and um, this was his funky chicken picture that he insisted that I include and I love it too so I'm so happy to include it here so uh, thinking about chickens this is some of the things that we look at when we're in the permaculture design course Um, we look at the key elements of a permaculture system and one of those is a chicken uh, in most cases what are their needs what are their behaviors what are their products and what are their intrinsic characteristics and we call this an element assembly and it's really about looking at how you can think about all the different aspects of a chicken and think about how you can meet those needs and uh, use the products um, integrate their behaviors and take into consideration their characteristics so it's not just simply about putting up a chicken house and and putting some chickens in and and collecting the eggs it's really looking at that whole system and that's what permaculture is it's about creating whole systems integrated systems where the the waste from one becomes the food from another and the cycles are integrated 
So um, some of the needs um, here we can see chickens need greens, grains, grit, insects, um, dust bars, companions, shelter, um, fresh air and fresh water. They produce eggs, manure. Um, if you're going to harvest the chickens themselves, then that's meat and feathers. Um, I, I tend to just keep chickens here in my place uh, for for mostly for their use within the garden, their companionship for the for our family and also for their eggs. Um, but I also use them, if you can see at the top there about scratching, um, I, I use them to actually help me prepare different areas around the garden and they forage so they, they go and peck off little insects in gardens too. But anyway, we talk a lot more about chickens within the permaculture design course and we go into this in far more depth. So let's just have a bit of a look at what a chicken needs in terms of, you know, shelter and other requirements. So a nest box, essentially a nest box needs to be a reasonably cozy space for the chicken. So, you know, maybe something like an A4 page size would be a minimum and it needs to have fresh, uh, clean hay in it. If, if the hay or material inside the nest box is, is dirty or has been there for too long, um, you're highly likely to get mites. So you really do need to make sure you keep that fresh and nice. And they also like it to be dark. So obviously, um, you know, here to see the chicken, there's been a flash use, but the chickens much prefer it to be nice and dark and calm in their, in their nesting box. Now, for their roosting, it's really a good idea to have um, a, kind of like a ladder type of environment and this one here you can see it's just been made out of sticks um, I've had ones made out of bamboo often even squound you know what I mean square a uh, rounded off uh, squ uh, square section timber is also really good for them um, so something around about a four centimeter diameter is good and if you've got quite a lot of chickens you might want to think about having at least sort of 15 centimeters to 20 centimeters per chicken uh, space and they like to have the the options to to move up the different perches you know for the different pecking order so um, it's quite a simple thing but it needs to be stable it needs to be accessible it needs to be up off the ground and it needs to be in a safe environment so that the chickens are safe at night now, uh, some in some places you may need to have a really secure environment. It depends on what your predators are. Um, if your predators are wild dogs and foxes, um, then you'd be wanting to lock down your chickens at night completely. Um, if your predators, uh, in say in my situation here, my predators are actually um, goshawks, and so they fly through during the through during the daytime. So I need to actually think about that. So different predators, different shelter requirements, and also depending on what your weather is. So for example, here in the subtropics, our, our um, houses are a lot more open, whereas in, a, in the cold climate, you would want to keep them a lot more secure and batten down less airflow if it's a really freezing night. Um, so, but it's really important to maintain good airflow in a chicken house because if they they don't they can actually get lung problems with too much dust and and um, bacteria and molds and all sorts of things inside now the other thing that chickens really need is dust or somewhere that they can scratch around and they flick up the dust under their feathers it helps them to manage their mites or manage to not get mites for that matter so it's a really important space now it doesn't need to be a big area like this it could just be a little sand bath it could be a dry spot underneath the house but somewhere that has loose-ish type of material that is a dry dusty material or a sand that they can um, scratch around in and you know typically if they don't have one they will find a spot to do it but they need a dry spot um, and that's a really important part for them to maintain their own health now the other picture here is <clears throat> excuse me is, is actually of chickens with ice and if you live in an environment like mine where it does get quite hot during the summer chickens do struggle in the heat and it is very important to provide both shelter shade for the chickens to be able to get out of the heat but also to make sure that they have something that can help cool them down and so quite often it might be a bowl of of ice blocks or a or a frozen chunk of food that they can peck away at 
um, or even a misting system that will come on and just cool them down and cool their environment down a bit. So these things are really important to make sure they have a really lovely nest box, a really nice and safe and, and um, sturdy roost, um, some good shelter, depending on which environment you're in, protection from predators and dust. So these things, if you can provide those for your chickens, they'll be so happy. Now, integrating your chickens into your design is also a really important part of thinking through from a permaculture system. Now, if you think about what what is it that chickens do? <laughs> they They scratch. So how can you use their scratching in the design? Um, they poo a lot. So how can you use their manure, which is a wonderful resource? Um, and also they pick off bugs and things. So, but what they also do is they scratch up around roots and they scratch off mulch from no dig gardens. And um, they might, you know, destroy little young seedlings if you allow them to get in there. You know, I've. If any of you have had chickens, you've probably also had the situation where your young bed of lettuce have, have been demolished by your chickens escaping and finding the best bit of greens for the day. But so what I try to do is, is create an environment where the chickens are integrated. So firstly, what I do is I create a safe spot for the chickens to be kept. And, and one of the things that I've got at the moment, particularly because of the goshawks, is an enclosed environment. So it's actually... A straw yard where they where they safely are during the day if I'm out and the chickens can be scratching away in there and they have deep litter inside so there's lots of hay so all the food scraps get tossed in there they're scratching it round with the mulch and they're manuring into it and so as it gets mixed um, it's creating a pre-compost so I open up a door just below just on the side of the chicken house and I scratch that down into my compost bays and then I have a three bay compost system right next to the chicken house which I then turn over and that becomes a compost that goes straight into the the garden which is just below it and also because I'm on a slope what I've done is put the chickens at the top the compost below so I'm scratching down and then the compost goes down even further and anything that's leaching also runs into it so the bananas that are just below the compost area are doing absolutely fabulously I also have a bucket that you can see in front of my compost there which is a big barrel which I put weeds into uh, so anything that's in the garden like farmers friends or moth vine or Madeira vine or whatever it is that I find that I can't put into the compost bin because it will come back through again I put it into there and it ferments and it turns into a lovely um, liquid fertilizer mixed in with some comfrey and also um, some chicken manure which I pick up from underneath the uh, the roosting area and so it's a really fantastic brew now as you can see in this picture as well um, the the downward slope is actually towards the west so I've provided some really nice shade for the chickens on the western side which grows up in the in the um, summertime things like mulberries for example which drop down fruit into the chicken pen and then in the winter time when the leaves fall off uh, I gather up that mulch and that goes either into the chicken yard as as mulch material or into the compost and the the um, and then the sun can can go in and allow the chickens to have a really nice sunny spot in the in the winter time as well so there's kind of integrated through the, the chickens, the compost, the fruit trees, uh, the vegetable gardens. If I want to take the chickens into the kitchen garden area, it's either when there are no fresh gardens that they can scratch up. All the things are, are grown up really nicely and so they can happily work their way through there or with a little fence so I can move the chickens to a particular spot, kind of like a little chicken tractor. And so that way they can be integrated into that area. But mostly the chickens are either in the yard or they're free ranging out further up into the food forest. So this is the kind of a few different ways that you might like to think about integrating your chickens. So one is what I've just been talking about, that they're housed. So they have a house with a straw yard and 
I keep adding lots of straw in there and chop and drop materials and the chickens scratch through it and quite often what I do is I go through with my garden fork and I just loosen it up too and underneath there's so many insects and worms and the, as soon as I come in with my fork my chickens race over and that's you know it's kind of almost difficult to get the fork in the ground because they're so ready for me to um, lift lift up that soil for them to get into it and and every now and then I give it a bit of a spray too because as it loosens up a lot more soil life starts to happen under there which makes more insects and bugs because chickens aren't vegetarian they love the bugs and they love the worms and they love all of that material so chickens can be housed also um, within your orchard area or food forest area you can actually create a rotational pen system so in the middle you can have the house and you set up a series of fences and within those you can seed things out or allow things to grow and as you move your chickens around you can the chickens have so much to be busy in so um, in this area here you can see um, on the ground I've dropped down a whole lot of uh, canna leaves and so they scratch around in and amongst that they're picking up the the leaves and looking for bugs and they work their way around and when it looks like they've kind of finished in that area then I move them into the next area um, so so this is a system um, that is I found really useful until the goshawks came um, now I actually just allow them to be either safely in the in the straw yard which has a, a, a roof or completely free ranging and the reason is that is because while they're in this rotational pen they've got pe they got pinned against the corner of the fence and weren't able to get out uh, so if if those predatory birds aren't an issue this is a really good system but I ended up having to pull down my fences and allowing the chickens to just to be able to run free because that way they can dive into the bushes or under the house or somewhere where they can find safety if they feel threatened by a predatory bird above and you can see um, this is a kind of free-ranging system that they now have access to the one on the on the right hand side so they're in there somewhere you can't even see them they feel so safe in there they're scratching around the fact is that the the planting there is so robust that it doesn't matter that the chickens are scratching around like they might fossick around a bit of the hay underneath they're they're picking up pests they're pulling off you know old bits of leafy greens but there's so much abundance and so much structure in there that they're not really going to do any damage as long as they're not concentrated if that was just their home and they live completely in and around under the bananas and I fence that off for a week they probably would decimate the whole thing but it it's that moving them around from place to place or allowing them a big free range area and just a small concentrated home seems to work really well but there's other ways of doing it too and these are sort of the movable systems so um, there's a small what's called the chicken tractor little structures that are built out of lightweight uh, metal frames or bamboo or recycled plastic or whatever materials light lightweight timber so something that has a bit maybe some some wheels um, a bit of a shade definitely must have opportunity to be able to hang water and food in that area uh, so that they they're not left out in the middle of a paddock in a small area without any food and water I find that this system is is better for me in the winter time in the summertime something that's quite low like that really does get too hot for the chickens another system that's good in many areas are these movable fences that you can see the portable netting and this has become more and more available now um, so essentially you can move them around either an open paddock area or in through an orchard you just pick a section that you want them to focus on some of them have uh, so they're electrified with solar panels other are just netting and it seems to work just fine too so either as an enclosed tractor or as a movable netting and and this system here with the tractor this is a much larger system that has the portable netting um, and these are um, our friends nomadic chickens and they're part of a dairy farm and these chickens follow around where the cows have been and help to scratch around the manure and and they stay in that particular spot until you know they're the, the manure has been spread and the grass has been um, nibbled down then they come and hook up the the trailer 
wheel it to the next bit and then the chickens keep moving their way around following the cows and so this is actually a commercial operation and um, it's called the nomadic chickens from the walker family farm and walker farm foods and they um they create just beautiful eggs so what do the chickens need with water well most importantly it needs to be clean and it needs to be cool now there's nothing worse for chickens than having completely dirty pooey um, water that has been sitting out in the sun it's really not at all good for the chickens your chickens will get stressed your chickens will get sick and um, you'll end up having a lot more problems and your chickens will obviously have problems so it needs to be accessible so if you've left the chickens out to free range or um, they or you know they're outside the house they still need to be able to access it all day wherever they are so you might want to actually have a few different systems around you might want to have a couple of little um, spots out in the garden where they can access it and um, and a and a really good way to do it is have one that's sort of a self-watering system you can see in the top that one just keeps replenishing itself um, the one down the bottom here with the big the two down the bottom with the big barrels uh, you just need to keep topping those ones up now the thing is about keeping it off the ground means that they're not scratching all the muck into it quite often people put just a bowl on the ground and and inevitably the chickens will scratch mud into it or step on the side of it and flip it up and before you know it there's no water available you know chickens you know in a hot day probably need an you know a half a litre or maybe even more each so it's a little bit more than what you think so you need to check it every day even if you do have a reasonable size system um, these little uh, self-watering uh, beakers that you can see on the on the side on the right um, they're very popular now and you can either buy them attached to a piece of pipe or you can buy them separately and just screw them into any kind of receptacle that you can find it's a really good idea though to also have really easy to clean um, uh, bucket or system so that you can keep the water really nice and clean and another thing that you might like to consider in the water is adding a bit of a source of apple cider vinegar or um, crushing up a bit of garlic and tossing it in or a bit of a, a sprinkle of diatomaceous earth all of these things help to keep um, nutrients and up to your chickens but also to um, help them to deal with any um, parasitic worms or um, you know bacteria and things like that so this is really important um, making sure that your chickens have clean fresh accessible water and um, you know every week or so you can put in these extra bits into the chickens water now the other thing is as I mentioned before if if it's a really hot day make you could actually just chuck a great big water um, uh, a big ice block in with that too so what about their food now one of the key things that chickens love are greens and they love all sorts of greens from your garden so I actually grow greens um, that are for me but are for the chickens simultaneously um, some of the things that they love to eat are you know things like kale and even th this um, Brazilian spinach and it grows in my environment it grows so um, beautifully so what is it in your environment that grows really easily that you always have a super abundance of that you can grab some outside leaves of and toss them into the chicken pen and allow them to feed on that um, other things that the chickens like are green manures so mustards and broad beans and daikons and then other things like oats buckwheat clover cowpea vetch so if you if you have an area that you know the chickens are going to go into it's a really good idea to seed it out with these sorts of things and it could be you know you could have your mix you could have your winter mix and your summer mix and and just make sure you allow some of them to self seed which means that you're going to have a constant source um, happening other things like amaranth as well and shady legumes this is pigeon pea now pigeon pea um, will grow in a in a more warmer environment and it produces an abundance of these um, these peas and legumes and so what happens is that the chickens are, are receiving shade from these um, legume shrubs and then when the when that's ready um, they drop down and the chickens can eat that too so it's kind of got the double benefit 
It's also really good to to sprinkle out some various sorts of seeds. Chickens love things like chia and sunflower. So the the picture on the the right the left hand side, sorry, that's chia. Um, so I just sprinkle out chia that I get from you know from the store, the organic store, and just sprinkle some of that out. That grows up and produces chia, and then the chickens come in and they they eat that up. Same with sunflowers. I grow them just to be able to feed to the chickens after I've enjoyed their absolute beauty. Um, if you do have a mixture of grain and legumes that you're feeding to your chickens, a really good idea is to actually soak it overnight because it number one, you know, like for us, it makes it far more digestible, but two, it actually fills them up more and, and makes uh, it actually makes the grain that you buy, if you're buying grain, to go much further. And another benefit too of you having grain um, is to sprout it because it, again it's uh, that's like maybe doing a 24 or 48 hour sprouting gives it even more nutrition again so you're getting far more value out of the grain that you're giving them. Now of course most people love to give their chickens uh, food scraps watermelon and other sorts of uh, melon uh, are just absolutely adored by chickens and um, you know you really don't want to be giving them lots of things like bread and pasta and all those starchy things that's not really the ideal food for them so fresh veggie food scraps are just fantastic so if you've got them from your household um, toss them out and and again you can see in the middle of this watermelon it's a it's a hot day so there's some ice in there um, or you know you can just toss it on the ground and it becomes um, part of the mix that they scratch up if you don't have enough scraps you know maybe go and find a, a either at the farmer's market the local food shop or even at the local um, supermarket go and find a box of veggie scraps from ask them if they can supply you with some they most places are really happy to give you those scraps and the chickens will be really happy about it too so you know as much as possible you can actually grow and source and forage so much food for your chickens without having to buy just sacks and sacks of grain which really isn't the best diet for chickens the best diet is a diverse diet and as I mentioned at the start the the more diverse and the more healthy and the more interesting the diet that you feed your chickens the be better quality eggs that you'll have and also the healthier your chickens will be and you won't have so many issues to deal with in terms of um, health and well illness more more to the point so I mentioned before canna and I really love this plant as a as a plant that that grows in in particularly in warmer climates but I've seen it growing very well all up and down the coast of, of Australia and it is a plant which can be grown rapidly so the leafy green material comes up and I chop great big handfuls of it and lay it down for the chickens so they they peck the green um, there's also a root that they they peck around at and what happens when you lay down the all the big leafy greens they're so succulent that um, insects come up to break it down and then as the chickens are scratching through that material they find all those bugs and eat those too so it gives a double whammy so this is something that I grow as a as a as a really important part of my chicken system but it also grows up uh, quite tall and provides shade afternoon shade as well so it has lots of different functions another plant that I always put around the edge of my chicken pen is comfrey so chickens will self medicate on comfrey if they need or and lots of different herbs so planting herbs in and around where your chickens will be foraging is a really great thing to do so they can find what they need and I and I often notice the chickens going directly for the comfrey so you know it's good to actually have quite a few patches of it and even a, a bit of a mother plant of comfrey somewhere else in case the um, chickens get a bit excited and, and sort of dig it up too much and you lose one so I have it around the edge of the chicken straw yard and I notice that there's always the side that's up against the chicken fence is completely trimmed they're always sticking their heads through and grabbing what they can um, and so it also helps to uh, help strengthen their egg shell and their bones but it also helps um, with egg production and, and improves the protein um, quality of the chickens diet but one of the things that chickens really love to are worms and my son 
is a really great uh, worm farmer. He loves setting up worm towers and worm farms and and harvesting worms. And he's often going into the chicken pen with a handful of worms and just watching the chickens go absolutely wild for them. So making sure that your chickens aren't just being fed grains and greens and, you know, a bag of grit possibly. So finding sand or crush up the shells. Um, What you need is also the live food. You need insects and, and worms, things that are really good protein for your chickens. And what what chickens to choose? Well, there are so many different sorts. Um, there are the standard ones that you get in the produce stores, the um, you know the browns and the the reds and the browns and the blacks and the whites. But it's really interesting to to explore the rare breeds as well. And you know, getting in touch with local chicken associations and chicken groups and local permaculture groups, you'll find someone who has um, various sorts of, of breeds or going to a local market and finding someone who has them available. I love my Australorps and, and Wynodotes, but I have also got a couple of Isa Brown types because these ones are all really great laying chickens they're ones that lay consistently so that I always have eggs available for my family during the week um, we've we have also at times had these beautiful fluffy little um, silky bantams and silky bantams are such delightful little chickens they're amazing little things um, I I find them a little bit challenging to keep however in our environment because um, while a snake won't even think about touching an Australorp or a big wynodote, uh, they a little peek in uh, Silky will will provide such a beautiful meal for a big carpet snake. Uh, so unfortunately, we've had to abandon all ideas of having these gorgeous fluffies. But in in an urban environment or an environment where you've got a completely enclosed house at night time then go right ahead. These guys are absolutely gorgeous. Um, The thing with the silkies, though, is that, well, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention about them. One is that they are really great in a small garden. Um, They'll go around, they'll pick off the pests and they'll pick a few greens, but they don't scratch like the big chickens do. So they don't disturb your, your mulched gardens quite to the extent that these really bigger, more robust chickens do. Um, But the other thing about the silkies is they don't lay so many eggs. So if it's not about the eggs that you're after, then, you you know, maybe you might want to go for one of those. But um, so find find the chicken that's right for you. Do some research about which ones are available, which ones are the most robust and hardy. Talk to your local um, chicken enthusiasts. Um, Find out where they are. Go and check them out. I, I've ended up choosing chickens mostly in my household based on um, what these young people decide it is. So they, they actually choose their own chickens and they come home and they all have names and they all get looked after by the kids and I support them in the looking after of the, of the, of the chickens. And they love it. You know, they come, they come up and check the eggs and they feed them and mostly the chickens in our house are, are looked after by, by the little people, which is just fantastic. So this love and care part of the chickens is really very important. Um, chickens, you can't just kind of put them in a, a pen down the back corner and toss them some scraps every now and then and, and hope that they'll be okay. Chickens really do need love and care. They need daily attention and they need companionship. So never keep a chook by itself. You really do need to have a flock of chickens. You know, the, we all heard about the pecking order. You know, it's part of their social behavior that they need to have a flock to feel happy. And if it's possible for you to have a rooster, um, depending on where you are, some places it's not possible in urban environments, that also really helps to keep a cohesive flock. And, and they also help, they're very protective Um, so, but if you are, if you are working with young kids or you have young children in your, in your family, you need to make sure that you have, you know, a nice friendly rooster. Um, we did actually have one at, uh, at one point, which terrified my young fellow and, and also left a, um, his talon in my leg. So he ended up with, I can't 
I, I'm dreadful in terms of killing anything. I can't kill anything. Um, so he he stayed here for a while and then finally we, we found a place to, to rehouse him. But, um, yeah, it's really important to make sure that, uh, you know, your children are safe and you have a – because if you if they don't feel safe and they don't want to go up to the chicken house and you feel threatened about going in there, the chickens will get abandoned. So it's a really simple thing. And I've seen that happen so many times. So uh, I think – making sure that you have like a really nice healthy flock of chickens if it's just your family you know four to six chickens is probably enough to feed you with the chickens um, with the eggs that you need um, and and that then doesn't require too much uh, space or time in terms of looking after them um, and also making sure that you are always um, friendly in your approach to them that you know you pick them up with care and that you you know I love to go in and I chat to the chickens wherever I'm going past and they chat back you know they're always calling out and and asking you to come and visit them or if you let them out they'll follow you around in the garden and do whatever jobs you're trying to do at the time and they just love to be around you they're very social animals I also had some chickens in the past and I'd be working on my veranda doing something and the the big black ostrilop would come up and just plop in my lap and sit there while I'm, I'm you know I'm typing away doing some work they're such wonderful, um, friendly creatures to have around. And um, here in our environment at the Eco Village, at, at, um, we have a, a no dogs and cats policy to protect the wildlife because we're in a wildlife reserve. We have kangaroos and wallabies and 160 species of birds and ground dwelling um, birds as well that cats and dogs are just not fitting in with that system. So, um, you know, my kids really love the idea of, of um, pets as uh, chickens as the pets um, because they are so friendly and they're really lovely to have and they live for many years um, you know a chicken in a in a healthy environment that's well looked after can can live you know maybe eight years or so now if keeping chickens yourself is too much for you you might want to consider the idea of having it being part of a shared chicken flock uh, this is a picture from Horshoi in Denmark, which is a, a eco neighborhood um, just outside of the city of Aarhus. Now, this group here, they have a shared farm as well. It's a really wonderful place. They have a shared farm. They have shared goats, shared cows, and they also have shared chickens. So if you want to be part of the chicken club, you there's maybe um, 10 to 12 families. And so every once a fortnight, it's your turn to look after the chickens, collect the eggs, um, you know, make sure they're okay, maybe move them to another spot. And so uh, what this means is that you get the benefit of having the chickens, of the fresh eggs and the companionship, but not necessarily tied to having to look after them every day. So depending on what your context is, maybe you might want to think about sharing uh, some chickens in, in your neighborhood. Maybe you have a uh, a neighbor or a couple of neighbors that are back on to where you are where you could actually have a gate that comes in and you you share care these chickens i think it's a wonderful idea and david holmgren's book retro suburbia you know these sorts of ideas are, um, are in there too about how you can actually work at a neighborhood level um, also shared chickens at community gardens obviously are a really important part of, of community garden uh, management and, and manure production and food scrap um, processing. I mean, chickens essentially turn, you know, your food waste into beautiful food and into beautiful fertilizer. So important. So in summary, really the key thing about the chickens is trying to create a connected design so that your waste from one system becomes their food and what they produce becomes food for another part of the system and there's an, you're kind of getting rid of waste and pollution in your system and, and also reducing the amount of things that you're having to bring in from outside to support your chickens. Um, diverse food, I think that's a really important thing that I, I've tried to emphasize um, in this session today and setting it up so that it's low maintenance for you. So self-watering systems, um, growing food for the chickens in and around your garden, um, creating easy clean systems, um, you know, maybe even setting up a, an egg collector on the outside. But having said that, I also really like the idea of, of having going into the pen 
because what it means is you go in, you're interacting with the chickens, you're checking out the chickens, you can see what's going on in there. If you just have a sort of an outside flap, you know, the tendency of you're a bit busy is maybe not to go inside. So, you know, you can do either or there. Um, the natural setting, so making sure you have, you know, lots of trees and bushes and, and grasses and cover. And and if, you, if you're in an urban environment, perhaps it's not, as easily to do that but really try and create an environment that's that is as natural and to their you know what their heritage would be Um, and of course love and care you know really taking good care of them they're such fantastic um, companions Um, I hope you also like this little picture here my this is a picture from my daughter she's started doing watercolors of birds As I mentioned at the start, this program is from the Permaculture Education Institute and the program that is run through this institute is the Permaculture Educators Program, which is a combined permaculture design certificate course and a permaculture teacher certificate course. So it's the two of those woven together in a comprehensive program online that's self-paced that you can do in your place, in your community and that you can register anytime. So if you're really interested in learning more about how to design your permaculture system, um, what are all the different elements, how to fit them together, and also work towards becoming a permaculture teacher, and that could be working with children, working in your local community centre, your local community um, garden, maybe running permaculture design courses, or doing international permaculture teaching work, um, This is the program that I've designed to try and facilitate and help people to create not just a lifestyle, but a livelihood out of permaculture. And I'm and at the moment I'm developing up some opportunities for people to come and teach and work with me internationally as well. So if you're interested in becoming a permaculture teacher, um, take a look at Permaculture Education Institute org to find out more information about this or you can email me at um, morag at permaculture education institute dot org to find out more information too and as part of this program in the next two days if you wanted to register i'm also going to include my practical online permaculture intro which is the incredible edible garden course for free so that's normally almost three hundred dollars And I'm including that because there's a lot of people now starting to ask me um, for not just the design and the teaching, but the gardening practical information too. So I'm bundling it all together um, as one course. And so that's available for the next 48 hours. So if you'd love to think about being a teacher, being a practitioner, a designer and a permaculture gardener, um, check out these courses. So thanks for attending this masterclass. The next one will be on October the 29th and at the same time from 8 until 9 and the topic will be all about water in your permaculture system. How can you design to really build water resilience in your system? Um, So it's more a gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute. So don't forget, if you want to sign up for the Permaculture Educators course, that's the Permaculture Design course and the Permaculture Teacher Certificate, and to get the Incredible Edible Garden course, check out this website, permacultureeducationinstitute.org. I'll see you next time.